Who's expecting something great? So let's just all stand up and How come to the front. Lord, I just thank you for this day. God, I thank you for who you are, that you were faithful and that you were good, and that there is not one who else could be like you, God. Lord, we worship you in spirit and in truth. Even now, we just raise up our own voices for you. God, we're coming higher to be with you today, Lord. Let's, your, let your presence come and fill this place, Lord, like it hasn't before. We are hungering for you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, have your way. We welcome you here. Come and do what you want to do in this place, Lord. Come and do what you want to do. Come and do what you want to do, Lord. We invite you here. We invite you here. Lord, we step out of the way. Just raise your voices. Make a sound. Just do something. Because worship isn't dependent on music. Worship is a lifestyle. We live a life of worship. Just lift up your voices. Jesus, we love you. We love you. We love you. From the inside out, we love you, God. We love you, God. We love you, God. We love you, God. Lord, it's our desire to worship you. And we're going to worship you regardless, God. No matter what happens. We will not say no to you. We will say yes, and our yes will be a yes, God. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Hmm. For every mountain that is high, he is higher. For every burden that is great, accent because it's terrible. I'll give you my country accent. That's about it. <laughs> All right, we got a few announcements to uh, run through this morning. We do have West Bay today. Is that correct, honey? Okay. We better find that out. But anyway, we have West Bay today at 2 p.m. If you are wanting to go there, please go over there. 
Those people love to see our smiling faces, and not many people go. And so if God is speaking you to go to say hi, please go. All right, we do have access to you tonight at 6 p.m., and this is not in the bulletin, but I'm going to throw this out. But we do have prophesy practice today at 4, but it's still just learning to dance. So if you're in the drama piece, don't worry about that. We do have the fireplace for the adults ministry meeting. It's coming up on Friday quickly, September 8th. So if you are coming, let my husband and I know, and uh, we'll be excited. Um, <laughs> We do have CCMAD distribution. That's on Saturday, September 26 at 8.30. And the block party is coming up on October 17th. We are gearing up for that. I know that there is a meeting. Block party meeting for the churches next week, next Sunday, right after service. All right. Everybody get that. Mark that in your calendar. We are also looking for donations. And the clothing is, in the, um, is an important one. We need toys. Toys is an important one. And Missy said we need food. That is definitely an important one. So those are the three main booths. So if you got anything, raise your closet, raise your kid stuff, raise your pantry. Or ask around. Send the emails out to friends. All righty. Okay, birthdays this month. We got a ton of birthdays and a few. All right, I don't even know the date. To, oh, today's the 13th. Joseph Fonda, happy birthday. He is, is he here? No. Oh, Joseph. My son calls him Jofus. Jofus Fonda. Anyway, he can't say Joseph, but happy birthday, Joseph. Nancy Marino, happy birthday, Nancy. He's on the 15th. And re the Reverend Brian Berge, he is not here. He's ministering in a church, but his birthday is the 16th. Brian Clearly, Cleary, <laughs> tongue twister. His birthday is also on the 16th. Shoot him an email. He's down in college having fun. And Shavana Pratt, she's not here this morning, but happy birthday, Shavana. Hers is on the 18th. All righty. I don't think we have anything else this morning. Anybody else have anything important to add? Huh. Oh. Oh. Well, they forgot to type anniversaries, but my husband and I's anniversary is on the 16th, so happy anniversary to us. Yeah. Who else is? Yours? Yeah. Oh, just seven. All righty. All right, I've been praying this morning. What? Let's take a picture. Okay, thank you for that. Anyway, I've been praying this morning. I woke up this morning and my eyes hurt and I was like, man, I'm tired. And I thought, no, that the sun is about to rise and that means that there is more today than there was yesterday. And I thought, okay, this day is going to be awesome. And you know what? We're singing about the mountain. God, you're higher than the mountain. And the Lord gave me a picture of this mountain. And we are praying, praying, Lord, move the mountain. We got the authority to move the mountain. And only God can move that mountain. So then the mountain is moved. But it's our responsibility to run through. And if we don't go, we won't experience the more. So we must go today, run through that uh, open area because so many times we just get so excited that the storm has passed, that mountain is moved, and we're like, oh, that's nice. But we never go to that next level. We never take that opportunity to run. So I just pray that over you this morning that you will be quiet, let your spirit be quiet, and allow yourself to go to that next level. All right, thank you, Lord. Let's get back to worshiping. Thank you. 
child shall lead them. It looks like some people might have a Cafe Italiano hangover this morning. We've got a lot of people out today. Pastor Brian's ministering over Rock Church of Lago. The Nisolas are out. The Mean and Doug are out. Caleb and Shelby are on their way back from a wedding in South, uh, uh, South Dakota. But it still looks a little sparse today because people came for the Italian food last night. But then this morning, the rain, they're tired. But here's the kids up here leading us. The Bible talks about let the weak say, I am strong. Yeah. Even in the midst of tiredness, in the midst of some soreness, in the midst where your eyelids need some toothpicks to prop them up. We say what, church? I am strong. Let's say it together and let's worship the Lord. He is breaking through the dark. He is breaking through that tiredness. He's breaking through weariness. And we are strong. Hallelujah. Take it away, kids. Lead us.
love has torn the veil. Your love can never fail. Your love is making all things new.
There's nothing worth more that will ever come close.
much more that you have to show us, God. We only know a glimpse of your presence. We only know a glimpse of your glory. God, we've only tasted a very small piece of your love. There is so much more for you to show us, God. Increase our capacity to understand it, Lord. That we might be able to love you more. That we might be able to understand you more, God. That we might be able to love you and to understand your love for us more, God. Because there is so much more. We only know a glimpse of your glory, God. We only know a glimpse of you, Jesus. Reveal yourself to us today, God. Reveal more of yourself to us. We're hungry for more of you. We're hungering for more of you, God.
when the rich young ruler ran up to Jesus he said good master what must I do to inherit eternal life and Jesus responded to him and said why do you call me good there is none good but God in our modern society in our way that we talk nowadays there's good then there's great then there's outstanding, then there's excellent, and there's all these other descriptive words that mean good. But with God, good is who He is. Good is what He is. And it's His goodness that demonstrates the truth that He is good to us. Remember Moses when he said, God, I... I want to see your face. He said, God, I want to see your glory. And God responded to him and said, no man can see my face and live. But Moses kept on asking. He kept on asking. He kept on asking. And God said, all right, I will let my goodness pass before you. He got to see just God as he walked past. And the residue of where God was, he left behind goodness. With the presence of God, it's more than just he showed up. It's what he showed up with. He showed up with his goodness. And here we are, we're singing about, I will pursue after you. I'm in hot pursuit, like Roscoe P. Coltrane. <laughs> but Jesus, but the David said in Psalm 23, goodness and mercy will follow after me all the days of my life. As we're pursuing after God, the goodness of God is pursuing after us. And when He shows up in our life, when He shows up in His service life, like, what do you need good today? This is the atmosphere where we can have it, where we can lay hold of it. Lord, we lay hold of Your goodness today. God, we thank You that You're good we pursue after Jehovah Jireh, the good. Jehovah the healer, the good. The most high God. And as we pursue after you, your goodness is pursuing after us all the days of our life. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord together. Now let's turn around. Let's dwell one with another. Turn around, love on somebody, hug and neck.
All right. Let's find our way back to our seats. I know you've already been greeted, but God bless you. Welcome to Rock Church. I am not the senior pastor, but I am filling in today for the senior pastor. Pastor, a pastor told me to tell you that no, he's not leaving the church. This is the third week in a row that he hadn't got to preach. Pastor Vinny was here with us. So what a great weekend we had with Pastor Vinny here. Amen. Two amens. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we had a great weekend with Pastor Vinny. And then last weekend, Pastor and Sister Kim had their staycation, vacation after Pastor got back from uh, Baltimore. And uh, this week, he's actually ministering at Pastor Dave's at Rock Church of Largo. This is their sixth or seventh anniversary this year. So we send our best, our blessing, and our pastor down to Rock Church of Largo this morning for their anniversary uh, convention this weekend. So pastor said, no, he's not leaving the church. He, everything's good. He even sent his lovely lady in pink over here. He left his wife behind. So he went solo down to Rock Church. Um, so we love our pastors. We love Sister Kim. Amen. Sister Kim, are you going to be cooking out this afternoon with your new grilling package? <laughs> <laughs> Rain or shine, cook out at the Brigitte's house. <laughs> no. Thank you guys for a successful Cafe Italiano last night. Wasn't it good? It was so good. A lot of people stayed home today. I went to church on Saturday. I ain't coming on Sunday. <laughs> we had, it was a great time. It was a lot of new faces. And I, I heard this morning, here this morning, of course, this is our, for those of you that, that don't know, or those of you that weren't able to come, this is our annual worship team fundraiser for the for the performing arts ministry and I, I hear it was quite successful with the fundraising that it was if I'm right was it twice as much as that that we've made in last year so praise God we don't need to necessarily give the number but but uh it, it was very successful praise God and all the people thank thank you to all the people that helped and all the people that came and it was a good night a good night um also, I do have one. Uh, there's the, Wayne and Diane are out. We got pastors out. And the um, uh, Boers are out. You know, all these people are out. There's one person that's in particular out today by the name of Janice Liveronis. Does anybody know why Janice is out today? She is helping with a new grandbaby. Yeah. Isabella Grace was born on Friday. And I don't know if you saw on Facebook the pictures of Mandy. Um, Mandy looked like it was a regular day. I mean, here's a picture of her in the bed getting ready to have the baby, and she's kind of, hey, I'm getting ready to have the baby. Then a picture of her right after she had the baby holding the baby, and she's like, hey, I look great. I just had the baby. <laughs> I, I told Kristen, I was like, I think that's the best pictures I ever saw of Mandy. I mean, I mean, not that her other pictures are bad, but she had the glow, the baby glow. So congratulations to DJ and Janice Liveronis. The new grandparents and Mike and Mandy Salonis, that, that that they're the new parents. And and actually my my outfit today, I, I'm wearing my uh, team colors, blue and maize for the Michigan Wolverines in honor of their first win, their ho first home win under the Jim Harbaugh era yesterday. But that's the secondary reason I'm wearing this. I'm also wearing this because. DJ, my good friend, and Janice, they're from up in Michigan. We all have the same team. So this is my honor of the new grandparents today. Amen. <laughs> so let's get ready to receive our tithes and offerings for today. Let's go over to Malachi 3 quickly. Amen. We should know it by heart. Not by head, but by heart. Um. Praise the Lord for the opportunity to give. Um, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. I touched on this last week, and, and there was a... We haven't read this scripture. Of course, we quote this scripture and talk about this scripture, but it's so good to be able to put our own eyes on it so that we see not what we think the word said, not that it's mental re recollection, but we can see it for ourselves. And there was one word in particular when we were reading this last week that jumped out on the inside of me that just jumped off the page, and it was the word prove. Verse 10, it says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, 
that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer. Who's rebuking the devourer? Who's taking responsibility for that? The Lord. And he will not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, says the Lord, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations, even the heathen, will call us blessed. I heard one man of God say, man, even blessed people call us blessed. For you shall be a delightsome land, saying the Lord of hosts. God says prove him in this. It is so common for us to see the Lord proving us in the scripture. He wants to prove what is in our heart. He even proved Abraham. He, the Bible says he tempted or he tested or he proved Abraham by asking him to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice so he could know what was in Abraham's heart. But in this particular area, the roles are reversed. And God's saying, I want you to prove me. I want you to test me. I want you to taste and to see that the Lord is good in this specific area. You know, if any of you have been flying on an airplane and had a window seat right along the, the wing, and you're on a flight and there's a little bit of turbulence, the, you'll see the outside of that wing kind of... And you hit a big bump in turbulence. Boom! Ba, 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 da, you know, you hear those wings, you're going, and you're looking at this wing out a few dozen feet. And you realize that, man, sometimes they put fuel in those wings. There's a big old engine on the underneath part of that wing, and you're thinking, I think shaking around pretty good. I wonder if there's a point where that thing can just pop off and, whoo, there we go. You know, there is a point. But they just don't throw that plane out into production and big, put a big load of people on it and say, man, I hope those wings hold up. <laughs> no, there is a, a testing that occurs on those wings. You can look up wing flex tests on, online and where they've got, they, they spend probably millions of dollars, five years of work, so that they got this big machine that brings that wing up to 100% of every conceivable load that could ever be on that wing. The worst weather it could ever throw against it. And they bring it up another 110%, 120%, 130%. And I know Boeing has it where that wing is supposed to sustain 150%. So one and a half times the most maximum crazy load that could ever go against that thing. So when there's people flying on that plane, that wing, that design is completely proven. In this specific area, along the same way, you know, there is a pressure that's applied to that wing to be able to know if it's going to sustain a load or not. How many know that there is pressure in the area of finances? That it's unlike any other pressure. You get a headache, you can take an aspirin to relieve that pressure. If you get a sinus thing, go get you some, you know, in the natural, you can go get something that will give you some temporary relief. If you don't have any money and there's a bill that's due and your lights are going to get shut off or the addiction's on the door and you get home and all your stuff's out on the curb in the middle of the rain, there is a can't sleep pressure. There's no Tylenol that can save you from that. But when we bring our tithes and our offerings into the storehouse, God takes the weight of that pressure off of us and he says, I'll take care of that. Where now we can put the load of this area on the Lord and he is 150%, 150-fold capable of tearing our load in this area. Amen? So we are getting ready to cast our care on the Lord and prove that we trust the Lord in this area. Amen? Are you ready to prove the Lord in this area today? Let's stand to our feet. Let's get ready to give. God, just like there's a test to be able to prove the chairs that we're sitting on, the bridges that we traveled on, the tires that we drove in on today, God, there is a test to prove that you care in this area. And it is the test of us giving. 
into the kingdom of God. The test of us sowing into good ground. God, we sow our seed in faith. We sow our seed in love. We sow our seed in forgiveness, God. And we sow our seed in cheerfulness today. We don't do this because we gotta. We do it because we get to. And we thank you for it. We bless you for it. And we come here cheerfully and hilariously to give into the work of ministry and into your kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Woohoo, I like that. Are you guys ready to get into the word today? Amen. Amen. Let's go over to Psalm 127. The 127th Psalm. You know, I try to train myself to stay on the platform or to stay behind the pulpit a little bit. It's hard for me to do that. I, I got to be where the action is. That doesn't have anything to do with the beginning of this message, but... FYI, <laughs> we've been talking about uh, laboring in faith. I had the privilege of ministering uh, last week, and we're going to continue on this same topic this week. And it's been so interesting the way that the Lord has ministered to us along these lines over a number of months now. That I've had, this is my fourth message on this topic. Pastor taught for three or four weeks on Mary and Martha, about us not getting so busy that we forget about the priority of our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor, Actually, pastor's teaching on that same subject down at Rock Church of Largo as we speak. Uh, even uh, Wednesday night, pastor was teaching on uh, being forgiven, yet I'm hearing stuff in the message along this area. And I believe God has us focused on this because he's expanding our capacity to affect the kingdom of God. Amen? Let me say it to you. Let me give you an example. Imagine there's this farmer, and this farmer is getting ready to sow some seed. But he doesn't have anything, any tools to help him plant that seed. He doesn't have any farm equipment. He doesn't have any livestock to help him. He doesn't have any, even any little garden tools. He's got his hands and a bag of seed. How many of you know there's a limit on the amount of ground he's going to be able to farm if he's just got his hand, his hands? He's going to have a maximum capacity to farm that way. Now, take that same guy. Stick some tools in his hand. Give him some tools uh, to be able to till the land and to harvest the crops when it comes time. All of a sudden, that same guy's capacity just increased. Same guy, but those tools increased his capacity to farm the land. Now, along with those tools, give him a team of oxen. Put a plow behind them. Give him a mule with a wagon behind it to be able to bring the crops in. Now, all of a sudden, once again, that capacity has increased. Now bring them on into the 20th century, the 21st century. Give them a tractor. Give them a combine. Give them some mechanized farm equipment. And along with that, he's going to be able to do the work of maybe 20 teams of oxen in a fraction of the time. And with the tractors nowadays, you got an air-conditioned cab. you got this big, bushy, nice seat to be able to sit in. So here he is, and then you add to it fertilizer and better seed and the technological advances in, in farming that's happened over the last 100 years. Now you've got this guy that's able to form, farm more land in less time and get better results, a better harvest than he would have been able, ever been able to do it by himself. Laboring in faith. The faith added to the labor is those tools there's a harvest in the land jesus said himself the fields are already white unto harvest and when we're laboring in faith when we're increasing in our ability to affect 
we have an ability to reach more people with less effort, less time than we ever would have been six months ago, a year ago or something. So in these messages, not just for me, but this theme that God's had intertwined with us over these last several months, he's preparing us for an increased capacity. Don't look at the number of empty seats today. Don't look at the rain today. Don't look at any of those things. Look unto the word of God and look unto faith. Amen. So let's read our foundation scripture that we've been looking at, that we looked at last week in Psalm chapter 127. And then we'll have a word of prayer and jump right in. Except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wakes but in vain. It's vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he gives his beloved sleep, or so he gives his beloved rest. Lord, we release our faith right now in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, we ask you, give us ears to hear, to give us eyes that see, to give us a a retention of this so that we produce fruit that remains and God we ask you by faith and come into agreement that our capacity is increased to be doers of the word so that we're doing the work of ministry not in our own strength but according to the capacity of the Lord Jesus himself because that's what you've called us to the highest realm of existence in the in the spirit realm natural realm every realm both in heaven and in earth We aspire to rise unto that level by your will and by your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Unless the Lord is involved and included in the building of a house, the guy that's building that house is doing it in vain. And unless the Lord is keeping a city, those that are staying up all night to watch over that city are doing it in vain. Now, when I think of doing something in vain, I think about doing something for no reason at all. There's no benefit to it. There's absolutely no productive use to it. It's a waste of time all the way to the level of, man, I'd have been better off not doing that thing at all. Now, the word vain that we see in Psalm 127 here, it means all those things. But the Hebrew definition of this word, if you look it up in the concordance, goes quite a bit further than just something that's being done for no reason at all. No reason at all. The couple of the literal meanings of this word is ruin or destruction. Think about the house builder, that he's putting that last detail, the finishing detail on a $20 million home. Now that home is completely done, it's move-in ready, it's worth $20 million. But if he's doing that without the Lord, the thing's already ruined. It might as well be a $20 million pile of rubble. It's, It's already been marked for destruction if it's being done without the Lord. One of the other definitions of this word vain in the Hebrew is uselessness deceptive uselessness what does it mean to be deceptively useless it's something that looks like it's the right thing to do it's something that looks like it's beneficial something that looks like oh man this is going to turn out great but it's deceptive because it looks like it's useful but instead it's really useless. You guys with me? Okay, let's go let's look at an example. Let's go over to Job chapter 1. The book of Job chapter 1. And just for a moment as we get into this, I want you guys to pretend that you don't know anything about Job. That you this is your first time ever hearing anything about this man Job, okay? Job chapter 1, and we're going to start reading at verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. 
His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household. So that this man was the greatest of all the men in the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day or every one his turn and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt sacrifices according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be, it might be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This did Job how? Continually. So, like I said, just act like you never heard anything about Job before. I know you guys have seen this movie. You know the plot line. And praise God, we know how the whole thing turns out. But let's just for a moment think about this way that we're being introduced to Job. What do we know about him? We know that he is a godly man. He is a righteous man. He is an upright man. He loves the Lord and he hates evil. We know Job is a very wealthy man, an extremely wealthy man. He's the greatest man, the richest man in the East. Now, if this were to be a modern story, that would mean that Job was a multi, multi billionaire. He's not lacking in any material thing. And it sounds like he's got a pretty big family. He's got seven sons, he's got the three daughters, and it sounds like his family loves each other. The kids take turns having these family get-togethers, these parties. And on the first Saturday night of the month, one of the brothers has a, a, a good party, and they have a standing dinner party every Tuesday night. And then on Super Bowl Sunday, one of the other brothers has a big blowout, and the whole family's invited. They're always having these parties. But in the next verse, we're introduced to Job talking about these sacrifices. Every time the kids have one of these parties, the next morning Job gets up and he offers a sacrifice for each individual kid. So they have a party. He gets up the next morning and offers 10 burnt sacrifices just in case one of them might have cussed God that night. One of them might have renounced God. One of them might have said, just in case they sinned, he, he's going to offer a, a sacrifice for them. Now, why would this be in the introduction, the very first part of the book of Job where we're being introduced? Let's find out. Let's keep going. The next part of this story, you know what happens. Satan goes to God and he says, man, I know your servant Job loves you. But that's just because you've blessed him and you got this hedge of protection around every conceivable aspect of his life. And then he says, why don't you take that hedge down, God? Let me have a shot or two at him and we'll see how quick he curses at you. And God's response is, he is in your power. So you know the next thing that happens? Everything starts falling apart in Job's life. One uh, servant comes and says, fire came down from the sky and, and killed off all the sheep and all the herdsmen. Somebody else comes and says there's some invaders that came in and took all the camels and took all the livestock and killed off all the servants. And then somebody else comes and says, your kids were having one of their parties and a big wind came down, a tornado or something came down and knocked in the house and every single one of your kids are dead. Things get even worse after that. Job is covered in boils. His life is completely demolished. And right in the midst of that, his wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? Now, of all the things that his wife could have said, good or bad, isn't it interesting that she says, why don't you just curse God and die? Let's go over, let's look at something at the end of chapter 3. The last couple of verses of Job 3, verse 25. This is Job speaking here. He says, For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that 
which I was afraid of is come unto me. Look at verse 26. I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. In, the, in my cross-reference, it has it also in present tense. I am not at ease, neither am I quiet, neither have I rest, but trouble comes. You know, to, to me, Job is speaking in the opposite. So many times, you know, all these things happen, you're like, I had no idea what was going on. It was the best day. It was, I, was, I was just sitting there and eating a sandwich and watching TV, and I had no idea... But there was this trouble going on I had no, about, no idea about. But Job's saying the opposite. I wasn't happy as a clam. I wasn't just hanging out. I wasn't at rest. Yet trouble came. Job, let me say it like this. One of the daughters comes in to talk to Job. And she says, Dad, it's Tuesday night. It's the dinner party. Why don't you come have dinner with all of us tonight? No, 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 baby, I'm not going to go. I want you to go have a good time, but I'm going to stay here. Okay, Dad. But I want you to do one thing for me. Just I want you to do one thing. Yes, Daddy. I just want to make sure that when you guys are having the party tonight, that you don't cuss God. That you don't curse God. And that you, yes, Daddy, I know. You tell me all the time. We're not going to do that. I promise. But I want you to make sure you don't do it. And tell your brothers and sisters that they don't do it either. And just in case they do, tomorrow morning when I get up, I'm going to give sacrifices off for all of you. Yes, Daddy, I know. And then, you know, the end of the year livestock report. Job, one of his servants is coming in. Uh, Job, Master, here's the monthly stats of, of what the livestock are looking like. And, and, and Job says, you know, oh, everything's looking pretty good. And he says, yes, sir. Sheep herd particularly is doing really good. Just last month alone, we had 127 new lambs added to the flock. And Job said, 127, huh? Yes, sir, I, I checked it twice. I, I want you to bring them all up to the house. All of them? Yeah, yeah, I want you to bring them all. Put them in that pen that I made special right up by the house. Because the kids are going to be having a lot of parties this month, and I'm going to need to probably sacrifice every single one of those lambs for the kids just in case. Now here's Job sacrificing. But he's not doing it in faith. How's he doing it? Fear. What's driving him to do these things? He says, that which I have been which I have feared the most, that which I have fray, afraid of. And he's saying, I'm not at rest, I'm not quiet, I'm not just hanging out. I am doing all these things, yet trouble comes. He wasn't doing them in faith. He was doing them in fear. Doing a godly act, but in the wrong heart. Are you with me? You know, we could have up here some orchestra, some symphony, some, the, the three tenors opera singers, you know, up here, and they could be singing our exact worship set. And they've got seven-part harmony and every conceivable... And, and when they say amen on pre-service prayer, the gong, you know, and all oh, worship is going to start it. And to our ears, it would sound good. And to our emotions, it would sound good. But they could be singing our exact same worship set for today. But if they're not doing it with the anointing on it, it's not doing anything for the Lord. A few years ago, several years ago, the History Channel was showing a lot of these Bible-themed TV shows. And when I first saw them, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm watching this. I got Bible on TV. Praise God. But then you're watching them, and you see these experts. Harvard University, Ivy League, professor of biblical studies, some guy that's dedicated his entire life to studying the Word as a history book, as a philosophical novel. And they're talking about the Word, and they got doctor in front of their name, but they don't have a clue what God's saying. They might know Chaldean. They might know Hebrew. They might know all these things. They can quote off Scripture almost as good as Jesus. But if they're studying it without faith, it's not producing any results. The church we went to 
when I was in elementary school, I found out that there was this man that every time he heard a siren, day or night, he'd get in his car and drive up to the church. He, middle of the night, he hears a fire truck go past. I got, I, I, I'm, I'm getting up, I'm getting dressed, I'm getting in the car, I'm driving over to the church to make sure it's not on fire. The police car goes past. Oh, it, it, I, oh man, I was sleeping, but I'm getting up, I'm going to church, I just want to make sure that nobody broke in, nobody robbed the place. And on the surface, it would look like, man, he's just got the best heart after the things of God. The first thing he thinks of in tragedy is the house of God. And, and I'm not disputing this man's heart. He did have a heart after the things of God. But that's not what was driving him to do those things. It was the enemy tempting him. Man, it might be the church. You need to hurry up and go in there. I, I'm going up to check out the church and make sure it's all right. He's doing something that would look like on the outside that he has a heart after the, the things of God. Instead, he's doing it out of fear. You know, we can do this in our life. Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 6, that if you give alms, don't blow your trumpet. <laughs> it says, don't blow a trumpet when you're doing your giving. And if you're tooting your own horn, that's your reward. No hundredfold return, no eternal way to glory. That's all you got is a little horn toot. The same thing with prayer. The same thing with fasting. People go around trying to talk about how much they pray or how long they fasted or this look on their face. Oh, I'm so hungry. I've been fasting for three days. So they can just say that they're more spiritual, that they're more holy than you. But if they're doing that to be seen, man, they have their reward. Or people just doing things in the house of God. The, uh, ulterior motives. Motives to try to get in with the pastor. Motives to try to be seen. Motives to try to get a place. Motives to be j just in competitive jealousy with everybody else. You know, so that so I can be more and do more than everybody else. You know, that everybody else is home sleeping and I'm scrubbing toilets. And on the surface, they're, they're you know, that oh man, well, look at them. They've got their heart completely after the things of God. But on the inside, they're saying, man, what would this place do without me? Is this play, do they even know all I do? What would it do? This place would fall apart if I wasn't here. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you Were you the rock that Jesus was talking about when he said, I will build my rock upon this church? But when we do, I, I'm of the opinion that every single aspect of church service is a privilege. If you're preaching a message, if you're singing a song, if you're moving a chair, if you've got the toilet brush in your hand, every single aspect, because when we do it unto the least of these, we've done it unto the Lord. And there is going to be an awards banquet when we get to glory that makes the, the, the Academy Awards look like nothing. That they're having, the, and it's not just the awards for who saved the most. Who, 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 who had the biggest meetings and who laid hands on the most people? There will be people that go up and get the awards for those type of things, praise God. The things that we in this natural world that would, would you know, the worldwide ministries and preaching the gospel to all nations and stuff like that. Well, then there's going to be some other people that we go in there and, and Jesus himself gets on the mic and calls a name and we're all standing up clapping. Who is that anyway? I have no idea. They must be somebody, though, because look at that big old hug that Jesus has given them. And then Jesus gets his award thing, and it's the Golden Toilet Brush Award. Because their call was to be the best janitor. They weren't called to preach to the nations, but they were called to do this. And then he's got another award, the, the Golden Flashlight Award, for the person that was out in the parking lot ministry when all the people that came late to church were still coming in, and he missed half the service because he's still going Disney World style, park here, park here, park here. The rewards for things that we don't consider as honorable, but the Lord does, because when we've done it unto the least of these, we've done it unto him. You know, I got to tell you this. There was a, a young man that I used to know by the name of Renato. Remember Renato? Um, when the company that I work for moved from downtown out to New Tampa, there was a young man that was the janitor there, a Brazilian guy, uh, 24, 25 years old, 
And, and I'm telling you what, it, it didn't take but a few days, a couple weeks, to notice that there was something about this guy. I mean, how many of you know there's not too many 20-something dudes that are janitors? I mean, you're not going to pick up a lot of girls with a mop in your hand. But And, and Renato was a good-looking guy, too. And uh, I noticed, I was like, man, that guy does something. I mean, he's got attention to detail that I, I can't even put it on my resume anymore compared to what Renato w would do. And that next Christmas, uh, we, we'd been there at, in that building a number of months, and that Christmas came, and the company sent out an email for people to uh, contribute for Renato to go back to Brazil for Christmas. And the company I work for, it's a tech company. There's a lot of smart people that are making a whole lot of money and a lot of people that know they're smart and know that's the reason they're making all that money, so they've got a big ego to go along with that. And it would take a lot for them to notice a janitor. A janitor. But money on into the thousands came in for Renato to go back to, to uh, uh, Brazil for that Christmas. It wasn't a while later that I see him with a shirt that said this name on it. J-E-S-U-S. And I asked Renato, I said, are you a Christian? He didn't speak English all that well, and I, he might have been a little bit self-conscious, think I was trying to talk bad about him. I'm like, no, no, I'm a Christian too. It's no wonder that he was a believer, because you can't clean like that unless you're anointed to do it. Hallelujah. A few years go past, and we find out Renato is, is leaving to go back to Brazil to start his welding business. That He wanted to go back home and do, he wanted to weld those wrought iron gates and fences and the stairway banisters and stuff, I guarantee you, I, I, I would buy a Renato fence gate because I guarantee you it's some good work. And we had a big party for him when we sent him off. And the company gave him a check for $2,000 when he left. He was not an employee of the company. He was an employee of the building management thing. But on up to the chief whatever officer, Notice the good work that he did as the lowest of the low in a company of all honchos, the lowest of the low, doing it unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Even if you never get thanked. Praise God. I, I believe we have a church that thanks people, that appreciates people. Yes, we give glory to the Lord, but we got a lot of hard workers and, and doers of the word in, in, in waking up early and staying up late and all these things in this church. But if you never get thanked, give a little dance. Glory a little bit more because it ain't over. And when we are sitting at that big long banquet table eating the bread of healing and drinking the thing, and Jesus calls your name and calls you up front and said, I know that nobody said thank you for that napkin that you picked up. But as far as I'm concerned, you picked up my napkin in my house. And I know there was a little snot on it or something like that, but you wash your hands, and I cleanse you from those germs anyway, but I want to reward you. And there's a little something extra in your mansion because of that. On into the, doing the right thing in the right way, hallelujah. Now let's go back over to our scripture. Well, actually, let's go over, in the interest of time, let's go over to Ephesians chapter 2. Talking about doing things for the Lord. There's a big controversy in the body of Christ now about the topic of grace. Big, I mean, big time controversy. Anybody else aware of this? No? Oh. You? Okay. Man, we're the only ones. Well, welcome to the welcome to the drama, everyone. <laughs> There are those who think because of the grace of God, you can just go do whatever you want. Yeah, it's already bought and paid for. Grace has already done it. I could go live high on the hog now. I can do whatever I want. Or when you talk about doing things for the Lord, when you talk about doing the work of ministry, people think that's works. No, 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 it's not by works. It's by grace. Let's look at Ephesians 2, 10, 2, 8. For grace are we saved through faith. And not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not 
of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So we are saved by grace. There's no amount of do goods and check boxes that you can do to get to the point. You know what? God said that was the last thing you do. You can come to heaven now. That is, it's not the works of the law that we're saved by. It is by the grace of God. It is a 100% free gift. All we have to do is believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus has been raised from the dead and we will be saved. He can forgive anything. Hallelujah. But then we don't have to work to earn a trip to heaven. But it's with that grace that then we work. Remember with Jesus? When he rose from the dead, he said, all power has been given unto me both in heaven and in earth. Therefore, you guys just hang out. You guys don't have to do anything from this point forward. I'll take it from here. Enjoy yourselves. No. He said, all power's been given unto me. Therefore, you go do something. <laughs> he said, you go lay hands on the sick. Whose hands are being laid on the sick? Ours. You go cast into demons. You go uh, prophesy in my name. But that we do all those things. We don't do that in our own strength, in our own works. We take that gift of grace that's been given unto us. Then we turn around and do those works. Yes, we are saved by grace. Yes, there's no amount of do-goods that we can get into the kingdom of God. But we take that kingdom of God that's a free gift. Then we do the stuff we're supposed to be doing, not in our own strength, not in our own toiling, not in our own smarts and intelligence, but we do it in his strength. It's that tool. It's that tractor. I love talking about tractor. You know, I'm a farm boy at heart. I may not dress like it today. We take that tool and we accomplish. My, my grandpa was a farmer up in Michigan. I had moved down here, moved out to Bradenton in the late 70s, right when a big construction boom was happening down there. And he did a lot of construction things. Well, Papa had this caterpillar loader. And I've got pictures where I was where I was just able to climb the ladder to get up on that thing. And I'm turning the steering wheel and I'm moving the levers. I, I, I couldn't reach the pedals, but I knew every lever, button, whatever on that thing. And we were, I, I was helping him one summer to do some work. And to lift a bucket of dirt up in that thing, it added an extra, you could lift a ton of dirt in one scoop. Who's doing the work? Papa. Who's lifting the load? The loader. The, lo the, the loader's doing the work? No, because if there wasn't a man on it, it would just be sitting there. The man got in, turned the key, put the gas in it, all those things, but it wasn't his strength that the work was being accomplished. Amen? He's doing the work. Papa's doing the work. I got to drive that thing too. Woo! But... <laughs> When, when he retired, that was my saddest thing when he sold the loader. That was my favorite equipment that he had. I was a senior in high school and Papa retired. I, do I got enough money to buy that thing? But this, this has nothing to do with this message. <laughs> I'm just reminiscing. I should not be saying this out loud. Let's get back in the anointing. But the, the power of that thing where instead of you having to scoop up, how many shovelfuls would it take to scoop up a ton of dirt? But all you got to do is shove that bucket, pull the lever back, and you're lifting up a ton. The power of God. Not doing works in our own strength, toiling under the curse, but using it via the blessing of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, the, the Bible also talks about, we won't take the time to turn there, in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Fight the good fight of faith that you may lay hold on eternal life. Who's fighting the fight? 
What kind of faith is it? I mean, what kind of fight is it? I've given you the answer. It's a faith fight. Now, if you're going to a boxing fight, you're going to use boxing gloves. If you're going to a knife fight, bring your knife. If you're going to a fight, don't bring a knife. <laughs> if you're going to a faith fight, you bring your faith. Is there a fight to be fought? Yeah. Is it passive? You know, one of the, the that scripture that we read in, in uh, Psalm 127 2, it's saying that it, why are you staying up late, waking up early, eating the bread of sorrows, toiling to get your, your needs met? And then on the other side of that scripture, it says, because God gives his beloved sleep. It's not a choice between I got to do it all myself or God's going to completely do it and I can just hang out and relax. No, there's a fight to be fought. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. Because we can be overcomers because there are some things that we have to come over. And how do we come over those things? By faith. Hallelujah. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. <laughs> There's a, we, Chris and I were in a, uh, a conference in, in February, and the man of God was talking about overcoming. He says, talking about coming over things. Kind of sounds like running over things. Like getting your truck and come over something and run over something. And then he's talking about us revving our engines. So we're going, hum, hum. The whole rest of the message, he goes, how do you do it? Um. So we rev our engines and we come up over something by faith. Like the monster truck that revs its engine and comes up over that big old pile of cars that jumps over that big line of buses or whatever. It comes over it by that power. The faith. Hallelujah. I want to look at an example as we get ready to close of somebody laying hold of faith. Go to Mark chapter 5. Somebody leaving toiling and coming up in faith, laboring by faith. Not leaving it all up to us and not just throwing it all on God either. Mark 5, 25. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all she had, but was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press. Let me do a Pastor Vinny here. How'd she come in the press? Behind. behind. She come up in front of Jesus? She came in the press behind. She came uh, in the press. Where are we here? behind and touched his garment for she said if I may touch but his clothes I shall be made whole and straight away the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague and Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him turned about in the press and said who touched my clothes and his disciples said unto him you see it the multitude thronging you and say who touched me and he looked round about to see her that had done this thing but the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace and be whole of your plague. Remember, we were talking about toiling last week. And toiling is excruciating hard work. Exhausting, continuous fatiguing labor never get ahead hard work long hours and never get ahead remember we talked about this relates to all the way back to the curse we talked about that last week with with uh, God saying as part of the curse when Adam fell by the sweat of your face will you eat bread not God supplying it but Adam's got to get that own need met nowadays and it says all the days of your life out of dust you came and out of dust you're going to go. And I, I preached on that and read that, but I never focused in on that part of that verse. He's saying you go, you started off as dust, and you go all your life. And at the end of your life, you return back to dust. 
like you were never even there. Never even got ahead. Never made a mark or anything. That's what toiling is if you're working in your own strength. Now, this woman with the issue of blood that we just read about, she toiled for 12 years for her healing. She went to any doctor who might have some kind of harebrained scheme to help her out. She went to some doctor that said, if I just put a bunch of leeches on you, that's what's going to heal you and help you out. Leeches didn't help. She goes to some other kook, and he's got some kind of uh, um, salve, some kind of ointment, some kind of cream or something like that. If you put that on, that's going to help you out. But no, it just gave her a rash. And then she went to some other guy that charged a whole lot of money and skipped town, and she never got any help. And then she did some other thing that she had to save up to travel way off to Damascus or somewhere for somebody that might know something about. She's spending all she had trying anything and everything in her own strength, in her own wallet to be able to get help and get whole and nothing worked. But she heard about Jesus. And she stayed home. And said, if Jesus wants to heal me, God will give him a vision and he can come find me at the house. No. Remember, if you were having an issue of blood, as of the law, you weren't supposed to come out of the house. If you did, what could happen to you? You could get stoned. You could be killed. This She was risking her life, not in her own strength. She was fighting the fight. She was going to lay hold of something. But she had faith, for she said to her, uh, said, if I could just get a hold of the hem of the garment, I will be made whole. And she didn't go face to face with Jesus. She snuck up behind him. Jesus said to her at the end, woman, what made you whole? What made her whole? Her faith. Now, I, I've told you guys this before. This was a statement that always confused me. This isn't the only time and only place Jesus said this statement. And I thought at best he was being gracious to somebody. At worst, maybe Jesus is lying a little bit. No, Jesus, you made her whole, not her. But we can see in this example, Jesus is going this way. She comes up behind him and touches him. Her faith is what connected to the power. Jesus didn't make an assessment, a checklist assessment at that point. Did, okay, what have you done? Did you go to church last week? Okay, check. Uh, he was totally unaware. He was going to help someone else. And the desperate, desperation, not in fear, but a desperation in faith, and a laying hold of the promise of God. In the press, in the thronging. Thronging, it was Jesus in the middle of a celebrity encounter. We saw Elvis on the TV screen last night, didn't we? <laughs> pastor Elvis Bergy was on the, our, our pat ladies, our, our pastor, man of God. But somehow in the midst of being a man of God, he loves Elvis too. <laughs> so we had, a, we had a video last night as part of our fundraiser thing, and there was a commercial in this, video of, I, I, I'm not even going to try to do the moves. I, I am totally unrehearsed in Elvis moves, but pastor, pastor doesn't even need to rehearse. It, it's in him. When, when we go on traveling, I, I've learned to love Elvis because you can go 14 hours to Virginia Beach and listen to Elvis for 13 and a half of those, <laughs> of those hours. And Elvis gospel on Sunday morning. When you, by the way, when you get to church and pastor's sitting out in his car and he's sitting there kind of by himself, he, he, he's, he's listening to Elvis gospel. <laughs> what was I talking about? <laughs> Coming into the faith. <sighs> Laboring and laying hold by faith. Yes, it was the grace of God that got her there. Yes, it was the power of God that got her there. It was not her works that got her there. But her laying hold and the power of God coming together is what did it. Laboring in faith. We've got the faith from God and we've got being doers of the word. Think about it like this just to solidify this point. All the way back into the garden. 
complete perfection. No sin had ever entered into the earth. Adam and Eve didn't even need clothing because they were clothed with the very glory of God. They got to walk with God in the cool of the day. They got to walk hand in hand. Oh, there's coming a day where we're walking hand in hand and there's no separation and we're not thinking about what does the throne look like and what does God sound like. When we'll be with Him, we'll be like He is. Hallelujah. And in that arena that we can't even conceive with our natural minds. God didn't build the, 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 the sun and the earth and the animals and all those things and then tell Adam and Eve to chill out. No, he says, you have dominion. You have authority. You subdue the earth. You, there's going to be a snake coming and some things you need to subdue and put down. But he didn't kind of kick them in the caboose and send them off to do it by himself. He said, no, I bless you. To be able to fulfill that call. We have a job to do. There is work to do. We got a block party coming up. And you might get a little blister on your hands. You might have to lift something. You might be a little bit sore the next morning after the block party. But we're not doing those things in our own strength. We're doing those things in faith. Hallelujah. And even, even this morning when you're tired and you're wondering, how much longer is Pastor Tim going to go? It was a late night last night. <laughs> Say, thank the Lord that we did it yesterday in faith. And we're going to finish up here talking about one last thing, and it's 5 after 12. Can you give me 45 more minutes? <laughs> no, I'm not going to keep you that long. <laughs> I love you guys. I, I, and I'm not being too loose in this. We're having a good time. It's a smaller crowd. But th this is such an important subject for now, for us. And I love you guys, and, and we're doing this. This is something that we're doing. The woman with the issue of blood, 12 years is a long time. She suffered from that. 12 years from today would be back in 2003. Think about all the things that have happened in your life since 2003. First weekend of the NFL season in 2003, I know what I was doing. That was before I came back to the Lord. I was waiting for 1 o'clock when they would start serving alcohol 12 years ago today, I promise you. So a, a, a lot can happen in a 12-year span. The, my identity has been transformed in a 12-year span. That woman's identity could have been caught up. She went to one doctor. This is going to be it. She went to the, the synagogue and the, the, the Pharisees and this, and she tried everything she could, spent everything that she had, and she could have thought that this is her lot in life. This is my identity now, is the shut-in woman that can't go out because I've got this blood problem. But in the midst of 12 years of letdowns, 12 years of defeat, she kept an identity of the daughter of Abraham. Jesus referred to her as daughter. Not his daughter, but a daughter of Abraham, a daughter of the living God under the covenant of God. Hallelujah. You know, Joseph, when he was sold into slavery, he didn't take on the identity of Genesis chapter 39 talks about Joseph. He was a prosperous man. In the midst of being in a foreign land, in the midst of all the things that happened with Joseph, he, he could have taken on the identity of this is who I am now. Keep in mind, Joseph was of a rich family. He was the, the prized son. He... Might have had a spoon, a silver spoon in his mouth a little bit, Joseph did. And he got sold into slavery. It could have been a point where everything came crashing down. You know, I mean, in closing, let me tell you this thing from my own life. On October 27th of 2001, I got a DUI. I wasn't living for the Lord then. I got a, I got a DUI during the World Series. And... Um, I went to jail that night. And uh, when you go to jail for DUI, or not when you go to when somebody goes to jail for, for DUI, they keep you for eight hours. 
because they want to make sure you sobered up before they let you loose. Because if you get out of there drunk and hurt yourself or hurt somebody else, it's on them. Well, I didn't know this at the time. I, who knows about this stuff? I'm just showed up in jail. So I'm asking one of the officers, one of the prison guards, what, when, when can I get out? You know, when, when can I, you know, family was called, paid the thing so I could get out. I'm like, well, when's the earliest I can get out? And he, he said, you know, it's usually, you know, what time do you come in? It's usually eight hours, but I'll tell you, at, at, you know, after five hours, we'll, we'll test you again and see if you're below the, the limit and we can let you go. Well, that time uh, came and went, and, and I'm waiting patiently, trying not to make a scene or anything like that, and you want to be nice in there. And um, uh, then at 6 a.m., the shift change, and a whole other group of officers comes in, and I realize there's been a shift change. So I walk up to two of these officers, and I said, uh, I'm trying to be just respectful of the officer. I have a problem. You know what their response was? Well, you're in the right place for that. <laughs> and I, I, I realized at that moment what it was like for a man to have power over another man and to be on the wrong end of that equation because in that equation, they had all the power and I was nothing. And I'm not trying to say, I, you know, I've done a hard time. I know what it's like. I'm not... Johnny Cash in Folsom Prison, you know, and standing in front of you today. But that's been 15 years almost, and I remember that moment like it was yesterday. And as fearful as people are to go into prison, prisoners that are ready to get out of prison are just as fearful or even more because they've received the identity of the incarcerated the identity of one that's in the system. There's identities that this world would try to put on us. But our identity is that of the blessed. I'm thinking of a story right now. Does anybody know who Bill Winston is? Pastor Bill Winston has got a, a, a big, predominantly African-American church up in, up in Chicago. And their ministry was getting ready to buy this, this big property. And God had already told them this was their property. And he's going in to talk to the the lawyer that represents the ownership of this this thing. And uh, the, the, he goes in there, and he's talking about buying the property, and, and they say, you know, um, the guy that owns this doesn't want to sell it to a black pastor. You know what his response was? What's that got to do with me? <laughs> he wasn't bound by oppression. He wasn't bound by offense. He wasn't bound by the outward appearance. He, I'm the blessed, hallelujah. I'm a new man created in Christ Jesus. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. There are labels and there are identities that this society would try to put on us that would cause us to be limited in our own strength. Because of man or woman, you know, black or white, fat or skinny, old or young, you know, Money status, job status, education status, homeless or not, all these different things. But when we receive the identity of the blessed, the Bible says that we are blessed in our deed. So when we're operating in our blessing, God commands the blessing on whatever we set our hand to do. Hallelujah. Let's stand to our feet. Whenever I think of that scripture... I think about my first block party. Not our, our first block party where we're getting ready to lead it. And we're going to Largo. And uh, our first our first block party over in Largo. And um, we're, we're having the first meeting there. And you know, I'm the low man on the totem pole. I'm just there to learn. And Pastor Brian says, Tim, open us up in prayer. And... I, I quoted off a, big, a verse out of Deuteronomy chapter 28 that God will command the blessing on whatever we set our hand to do. And every time we do a block party, I pray that prayer because of what happened. That was, that was the first block party we ever had it. 
um, not on the street. And Pastor Brian was concerned about not having it on the street because if you have it in a church parking lot or something somewhere, they think it's a come and be at my church party. It, we, were, we were having it in that park. And they think, well, if it's, a, if it's at the park, they think it's a church picnic or a church bazaar or something like that. But we had already prayed. There were some natural concerns, but we had already play, prayed that God would command his blessing. And so many of you know, is this mic going off? So many of you know that, um, is this one off too? Hello. Okay. <laughs> so many of us were there that day and got to see that there was that whole community of homeless people that lived in that park. And I still think that there was one of the highest uh, soul winning days that we had in all the block parties we've ever had. Nothing that we could do in our own strength, but it was only by the power of God. God will help you. If you're doing some churchy things, but on tomorrow morning when you show up at the office, He's going to help you. Tomorrow, tomorrow evening when you're cooking dinner, He's going to help you. This afternoon when you want to take a nap, <laughs> He's going to help you. Hallelujah. We're laboring in faith. We got a busy rest of the year, church. Block parties coming up. Play practice, dance stuff. Leadership's coming back, I hear. You know, all these different, all the different things. And your flesh may get weak. And you may need to take a rest from time to time. That's okay. But whatever you're doing, don't you do it in toiling. Don't you do it in your own strength. Because we serve a God that will give us the strength and give us the wisdom. And I just want to close with this. Remember that word that Pastor Vinny taught the last Sunday night of, of uh, August when he was here about that morning time with the Lord and writing things down. Such, a, such an awesome word. That time with the Lord is your fuel to be able to go and do. Hallelujah. I don't need to re-preach that message. He already preached it. We don't need to retouch on it. Now, go back and hear what he said again. There, there's more revelation than what we got the first time because God's never done. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your revelation. God, we thank you for the opportunity to come together and worship you. God, now I minister strength to your people. I minister rest to your people. But we're not resting where we're laying back Rest in where we're resting in you and we're resting in faith as we're laboring in it. It sounds like a contradiction, but it's not. We put our hand to the plow. We're doers of the word and we watch you bring the fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold on whatever we set our hand to do. God, we bless you. We love you and we thank you that you are our God. And God, now we send your people out in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name and in power. Amen. God bless you.